the life of a park ranger often followed the gentle rhythms of nature. Punctuated by the rustling leaves, the calls of distant creatures, and the soft sounds of the wind dancing through the trees, my cabin, nestled deep within the heart of Yosemite National Park, offered a haven of solitude and tranquility that I cherished. One evening, as the sun cast its golden hues upon the land, I found myself rummaging through the old wooden drawers of the cabin, searching for a long-lost map. Amidst the clutter, my fingers brushed against something unexpected. I pulled it out, a faded photograph, its corners dog-eared, its colors slightly washed out by time. In the photograph, a group of humans stood alongside a towering figure, something that resembled Bigfoot, the legendary creature rumored to roam these woods. My heart raced as I turned the photograph over, revealing a date 1930 and a set of coordinates, apparently pointing to a location deep within the park. Fueled by curiosity and a sense of adventure, I decided to follow those coordinates to see how that place had changed over the years. Armed with a backpack and my map, I set out early one morning, the forest alive with the songs of birds and the gentle rustling of leaves. Hours turned into miles as I hiked through the rugged terrain, following the trail as best I could. But as the sun began its descent, I realized I was hopelessly lost. Panic clutched at my chest as I reached for my radio, only to find that there was no signal. Desperation turned my footsteps into a haphazard dance, my eyes scanning for any sign of the trail or a way out of the dense woods. The shadows deepened, and the trees seemed to close in around me, their branches clawing at the sky. And then, in the midst of my disorientation, I sensed something watching me. The hair on the back of my neck prickled as I turned, my heart pounding like a drum. Emerging from the depths of the forest was a figure that defied all logic. It was tall about eight or nine feet, its form a shadow against the fading light. Its legs were long and skinny, arms even longer, nearly reaching the ground. Its body was rounded, connected to a long, slender neck that held no face, yes, no face. The impossibility of what I was seeing sent shivers down my spine. Before I could react, the creature lunged, its movements uncannily swift for its build. It tackled me to the ground, and I grappled with it, a primal instinct for survival fueling my struggle. But then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, the creature melted back into the woods, vanishing without a trace. I lay there, breathless and bewildered, my mind racing to process what had just transpired. And then, like a lifeline, I heard the distinct sound of footsteps approaching. My heart leaped with hope, and I turned my head to see another park ranger emerging from the trees, a flashlight in hand and concern etched on his face. He extended a hand, helping me to my feet. Are you okay? he asked his voice a soothing balm amidst the chaos of my thoughts. I could barely find the words to respond. I... I don't know what I saw. It was... a creature. Tall, no face. It attacked me. His eyes flickered with a mix of understanding and unease. I've heard stories. There are things out here that can't be explained. Together, we walked back through the woods, my mind still reeling from the encounter. He shared tales of his own experiences, of legends whispered around campfires, of unexplained occurrences that defied rational explanation. As we made our way back to civilization, I couldn't shake the feeling that the photograph, the coordinates, and the creature were all connected in ways I couldn't yet comprehend. The mysteries of Yosemite National Park were far greater than I had ever imagined, and as the night settled around us, I knew that my journey was only beginning. My name is Andrew, and I've served in both the National Guard and Special Forces for over a decade. Throughout my career, I've faced countless challenges and dangers, one such ordeal I experienced in the remote forests of the Appalachians. It all started when our unit received a distress call about strange disappearances of locals in a secluded area of the forest. The local authorities were baffled, and rumors of a quote cryptid creature roaming the woods spread like wildfire. As part of a specialized team, it was our duty to investigate and neutralize any potential threat. Incognito, and with government blessing, our mission began with a sense of excitement mixed with apprehension. We were seasoned veterans, accustomed to handling high-stakes situations, but the unknown always carried an extra layer of tension. Our squad consisted of skilled soldiers, 
each with their own expertise and combat experience. The forest was dense and eerily quiet as we ventured deeper into its heart. The canopy overhead blocked out most of the sunlight, casting eerie shadows on the forest floor. It was easy to believe that something sinister lurked in the darkness, watching our every move. As night fell, we set up camp and prepared for what lay ahead. That's when we first encountered the creature. It emerged from the shadows, its eyes glowing with an eerie light. It stood on two legs like a massive, muscular wolf, its fur bristling with primal energy. It was a dogman, a definitely live creature. It attacked our camp so we acted swiftly, weapons at the ready. But the creature was faster and more agile than anything we'd faced before. It seemed to possess an uncanny intelligence, evading our bullets and hiding in shadows. In the end, it escaped and we pursued it relentlessly, determined to eliminate him, if not capture. But we lost him. Damn creature was faster than a four-legged wolf. It was as if the forest itself protected him, shielding it from our efforts to capture or kill it. We stayed for few days, searching for tracks or a cave where he lives. Our frustration grew. We were trained to handle human adversaries, not mythical creatures. Doubt crept into our minds, but I refused to give up. I had seen the creature with my own eyes, felt its presence in the depths of the forest. And yes, I was skeptic. In the end, we were forced to withdraw, our mission incomplete. The cryptid remained at large. We made a report to our higher-ups about what we've seen, but they mocked us. Some called it a hoax, others a figment of our imagination. But I know the truth, and I swear by all that is sacred that what we encountered in those dark woods was real. My uncles were attacked by a creature like this dogman going through a jungle area of Mexico in the 70s. They were driving a big cargo truck at night when something jumped on the back of the truck. They didn't stop to see what it was because there were no lights on the road. My uncle on the passenger side saw this devilish creature that looked like a dog climbing closer to the cabin of the truck. They said the thing was huge. My uncle screaming in fear when they saw it, said they tried to shake the truck, but it would fall off until they hit it against a tree on the opposite side of the road or path. They kept driving all night to the morning all freaked out. When they got to a gas station in a village they saw gash marks in hand, but animal prints on the windows where it was trying to get in and on the back trailer. They told their story to some of the villagers or farmers, and they told them that dogmen like demons roamed those areas, and they were not the only ones who had been attacked before. They were so freaked out the hair on both arms rose even telling their experience. They said they never drove through Central America besides the cities or villages at night ever again. I wish I could have recorded them telling the stories. They have died already, but even before they died they stuck with what happened to them, and they never did drugs. The kids and I saw some kind of creature at the edge of a field, stalking a group of deer today, right before sunset, around 7-8 p.m. Yes, it was moving its head and ears. It was not a tree stump. We only managed to capture its attention a few times, where it turned and looked directly at us. You can see it turn its head and look over at us in the video, then immediately turn back to watching the deer. It wasn't concerned with us at all. It was completely fixated on the deer. I know it's another typical blurry picture where you can barely make out its features. It was across a large field, and this is the clearest picture our phones could get. But you can clearly see its ears, an eye, the shape of its head, long arms in the front, and what looks like a mane around its neck where the hair is longer or thicker. It doesn't look like a bear to me, and there aren't any cougars around this area, at least not that I know of. This was out east from Chisago Lake, Minnesota, where a family friend of ours had a pretty terrifying encounter some years back with a creature that walked on two legs, bent backward, and ran across the road right in front of her vehicle. She's so traumatized by the experience she won't even talk about it. Anyways, it has taught me to keep an open mind about things. We have two encounters not far from this area actually. Maybe I'll come back one day and tell those stories. But for now, I'm just looking for some feedback on what others think it might be because I have no idea. It looks pretty weird.
a very good friend of mine was working on a ranch in Montana in about 1986. He was herding up some horses and went up over a hill with forest on either side with a clearing on his left. The horses were uneasy which brought him to notice something in a clearing to his left. There squatted over an animal was this huge grey, red-eyed dog thing. What really stood out to him was it had three really razor-sharp long claws. The light was shining through the trees onto him, and it turned and looked right at him, and then turned back to eating his prey. I always believed my friend and his description is clear as day in my own mind. Never heard anyone else talk about the three claws, though so that's why I always listen to other people's dogman stories. I'm an 18-year-old woman who lives in New Mexico. I'm Navajo and half Mandan Hidatsa. I have been curious to see what other skinwalker stories are about, and I can kind of relate. My family never mentioned skinwalkers or witches to me, so I knew nothing about them. My grandpa died a few months ago this summer, so my parents sent me to live with my grandma to help her around her ranch on the res. Well, I brought my cat along. Well, just after two weeks of living there, my cat went missing. I figured that he would come back, but he never did. I called him and looked for him, but nothing. So I went to go put some hay behind the barn for the horses when I saw my orange cat's remains. I thought maybe something attacked him like a coyote, so I picked it up, and I saw that there were no bones, just skin, and the outside of his fur there was red and yellow, even white paint on the outside of him. I couldn't figure out what it was. I buried him behind a hill with a little stone with his name carved on it. I was so heartbroken. My grandma said she could get me a new cat, but I didn't want a new cat. Soon enough I kept hearing meows outside the Hogan and scratches at the door. My grandma doesn't have any other cats so I would open the door and find nothing. And when I went to go check on my cat's grave and dig it up to make sure he was still there he was gone but his bones were there. I just couldn't believe it. Why were his bones there? I thought I buried his skin. Ever since I lived there I have experienced some of the strangest things in my life. I don't want to go back and live there. I can't even share what kind of crazy things happened to me because from there I drew the line. I was confused and scared about these people, but at the same time, I knew I was one of these people. I have a greater respect for the Navajo people which is why I don't think getting involved with skinwalkers is a good idea. Just don't mess with them, and they won't mess with you. Used to work overnight shift doing industrial x-rays. We would go to a fabrication yard and do our work after the night shift left for the night. The yard was about 1. 5 HRS away so we woke to leave the city at about 2 am in our big cube truck. So one night B and my buddy are heading out. There's not much traffic at this hour and we were just leaving the outskirts of the city and getting up to highway speeds when I see something up ahead. I quickly realized there were three young moose in the road. Springtime in Canads, it's not uncommon to see young moose on the highways, but I've never seen more than one at a time and not this close to the city. I hit the brakes hard, but this truck was pretty heavy and I knew I wouldn't stop in time. My first instinct was to hit the horn and scare them, but I immediately realized the way they were I might be able to steer between them. But if I hit the horn they might scatter, and I might end up hitting more than one. I was lucky I got this beast of a truck's speed down enough to steer between them and came to a full stop. I could actually look into one of their eyes as I steered between them and I saw terror in the poor animal's eyes. Just as I thought them finally seeing us scared them, and they scattered and ran past the front of the now stopped truck and off into the woods. We just sat there for a couple minutes in total shock. We couldn't believe our luck. It happened when I was younger. We had been snowed in for a few days and my girlfriend needed cigarettes. She was driving me nuts, so I threw on my winter gear and took off for the grocery store which was a three hour hike from where we were mountain country. I was planning to be there at dawn when the store opened so I could pick up some other things we needed. There was a full moon that night, so seeing wasn't a problem. It was bright enough to read by. About an hour into my journey, I thought I heard a woman laughing. I stopped, looked around and listened. Nobody, so I kept on trucking. Another hour later, I hear some more laughter and I catch something from the corner of my eye. 
I turned to look and saw the woman. The woman was my girlfriend's size, maybe five foot two. She was in her late teens or early twenties. She was a brunette who wore her hair in a bun and had skin as white as milk. And she was completely naked. I could do nothing but stand there and look at her. The woman acted as if she was impervious to the cold, and it was cold. She never said anything, but she laughed a little while she sized me up. Finally, the woman turned around, shook her bare ass at me, and then motioned for me to follow her off somewhere. I didn't move a muscle. You see, my grandfather was a Scotsman who believed in fairies, and he had told his grandson all about the dangers of meeting strange women in the woods. The woman turned around and saw I wasn't coming. That got her mad and she took up this, I'm so angry at you, Tinkerbell pose with her hands on her hips. I started to walk away and I could hear her sputtering in anger until she was out of sight. A couple hours later, I'm in town and I report the woman to the constable. He said his guys would be on the lookout for the woman I found out later, I wasn't the only person who saw her. Then I went to the store, bought the cigarettes and a few other items, like some oatmeal cookies which my grandfather said would help if you were lost in the woods and maybe pixelated. Got back home before noon. My girlfriend was pissed that I had taken so long. She didn't believe my story either. That summer, I dropped her and got me a new girlfriend who didn't smoke. I was the primary witness, Josh, at the time being 16 years old and a boy scout aiming to earn my eagle badge. My plan was to undertake a public project, and I chose to clean up the Sam Crocker Cemetery in Goodwater, Missouri. Three of my friends joined me and agreed to assist in the project. Additionally, my brother and his friend came along to be dropped off at a local creek for fishing. We all piled into my Grand Cherokee and left for the cemetery arriving around 11.45 after dropping off my brother and his friend at the fishing spot. We started working on the project, and by around 1.30 p.m., two park rangers showed up to check on us, mentioning they would be in the area. Later, one of my friends noticed something odd in a clearing near the cemetery fence, initially thinking it was a bear. He alerted me, claiming the bear was heading toward the creek. We decided to fetch my brother and his friend, and upon their agreement, we all returned to the cemetery after lunch. While retrieving my water bottle, one of my friends noticed a terrible odor, reminiscent of rotten eggs mixed with a strong stench of animal feces and urine. I also smelled it and decided to investigate. Heading down to the road, assuming it was a dead animal, I spotted a silhouette pacing back and forth in the wood line. Thinking it was a bear, I began making my way back, yelling for my friends to return to the car. It was then that I realized the creature was bipedal, not a bear. As it seemed to acknowledge being spotted, the creature dropped to all fours and started running through the cemetery. We all hurried back to the vehicle and sped away. In the back of the vehicle, my brother could see the creature chasing us. Looking in his rear view, I claimed it looked like an all-black German shepherd, about the size of a small pony, with stoplight red eyes. At some point, the creature jumped onto the hood of the jeep. I slammed on the brakes, causing it to fall off, and it stood up in front of the jeep, staring at us. I estimated it to be about 6 feet tall, weighing 200 pounds, with jet black or brown hair covering its entire body. The redness of its eyes puzzled me. After a few minutes, the creature dropped back down to all fours, seemingly grabbing onto the back bumper. We reached the highway, where we saw the rangers. I attempted to alert them by honking and shining my lights and at that point, the creature jumped off. We drove for another 10 minutes before turning around. Upon returning, we saw the rangers standing over something on the road. One ranger approached my vehicle, informing us that they had put down an animal, and that we needed to leave, as their bosses were on their way. I agreed. While driving, we passed three park ranger trucks and a trooper moving fast. The trooper pulled me over, took our names, and mentioned a dog had been put down. I was relieved to get out of there. Six or seven days later, I received a call from the scoutmaster, who knew about the incident. He asked me to come to his house to discuss my Eagle Scout badge, and I agreed. Upon arriving, I saw a park ranger vehicle and a black suburban parked outside. Inside, I found the scoutmaster, a park ranger, and three figures in black suits, two males and a female. 
The female, wearing a black pantsuit, took out a clipboard and went outside. The ranger asked if the creature had damaged my vehicle, and I replied that it hadn't. The taller man stated, We're giving you this today because we know that you are trustworthy, and you cannot tell anyone what occurred that day at the cemetery. You have to let your friends know exactly what happened, that you guys saw a bear, got spooked, and left. Tell your friends the same thing we're telling you otherwise, we will come back, we will come to your home. He then proceeded to name every person in the vehicle, seemingly issuing a threat. Shortly after this meeting, the scoutmaster and his wife moved away, and despite my attempts to locate him on social media, I was never able to find him. I am a former state certified law enforcement officer and academy trained in Tennessee, and miss without question this creature is the real thing. I ceased driving at night and ceased going out into the woods. I live on 43 Zuzanzan Acre Pickwick Lake surrounded by forested national and state wildlife refuges in three states MS, AL, and TN. Sir, I have no reason to lie or fabricate a story. In all these sightings, on two of them, I had eyewitnesses in the vehicle with me. The Ems Highway 25 sighting by the railroad overpass bridge in Tishomingo County, Minnesota, was the same creature I saw on the levee on State Route 128 in December 2010. Apparently, these creatures travel in swampy or drainage ditch areas close to roadways, or in forested areas with thick tree lines near pastures. My brother and I were waiting for our bus at our usual corner stop. It's about three blocks away from our house, and there's a pretty densely wooded creek nearly one two blocks behind our bus stop. The first thing I noticed that was off was that my brother was standing completely rigid, staring intently down the long road. There are only two street lights and a few automatic porch lights down there. I shook him a little bit and asked what he was looking at. He shushed me almost immediately. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a large, black shape darting on two legs across the street, to the line of houses on the other side, before disappearing. Thankfully, our bus arrived soon afterward, so we got out of there. I have never told anyone this, but in 2014 I used to work at a Thai restaurant that was right next to a Walmart. Once in a while, when my break would start I would walk over to Walmart. One time, I was walking on the sidewalk about midway between the two buildings and a woman exited the Walmart with a young child in a stroller. As I walked past them I looked at the child and it looked over at me. And I'm not joking when I say this, the child's face turned grayish or green, expanded somewhat on the sides, and stretched out a bit in the front, its eyes turned black. It glared at me and stuck its tongue out at me, this only lasted a couple seconds. Its face and eyes immediately went back to normal, and it looked away like nothing had happened. I instantly knew that it was mocking me and did it deliberately so that I would see it. There was no one else on the sidewalk. It happened very fast, but I remember it very clearly and think about it every once in a while, even though it happened nine years ago. When it initially happened, I thought the child's face was shifting because it was about to throw up. But then, when it stuck its tongue out, I realized that I had just witnessed it shift on purpose. I know what I saw and even remember knowing exactly what I was seeing as it was happening. I instantly knew that this thing had done so intentionally, and it was not some mistake. I have never been able to get the image out of my head. The best reference I can give is from the movie, The Devil's Advocate. There is a scene where the women are trying on clothes in a store, and as the one woman pulls her dress over her head to try it on her face morphs into a demonic shape for a couple seconds as she looks at the other woman. That is exactly what happened to me, except it sort of looked reptilian or demonic at the same time. Can't stop thinking about what happened. Does anyone here have experience with these things? My older brother Jake has always been fascinated by cryptids. It started with the classics like Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster, but soon his passing interest turned into a full-time hobby. If there was a story about a mythological creature anywhere in the world, Jake knew it. I can't blame him. Our parents passed away a few years back, leaving us with a bunch of money and nothing to do with it. 
Whenever he talked to me, excited about a new creature sighting, I always just let him go on. Earlier last week, he showed me a new news article. A woman had been attacked near an abandoned town in the Australian outback. Whatever had attacked her left long straight cuts across her back as she escaped. Jake was pretty sure he knew what had caused it. He opened one of his books and slid it over to me, pointing to a passage. It read, Malangi. In Australian Aboriginal mythology, Malangi is a spirit of the night who, during his travels in the dark, seeks to find his way home. Malangi's stone knees knock together as he walks. Both people and beasts fear him, for he kills tribesmen with his stone axe at the slightest provocation. Other animals, such as the eagle hawk, may be killed with the stone knives attached to his elbows. His face is said to be an awful sight, with burning eyes that make him appear to be a devil. The Encyclopedia of World Mythology and Legend, 3rd edition. So Ryan, you feel like heading to Australia? He asked excitedly. It wasn't the first time he'd suggest a trip to look for a creature, so I agreed. Jake chased his creatures, and I got to travel. I figured it was a win-win. We arrived in Australia, got a rental car, and set off into the outback. As we drove further into the interior, the road turned to dirt, and I started getting worried. Our rental car looked new, but we were already far from cell reception. It would be very bad news if we broke down. After another few hours, we arrived at the ghost town. Decrepit wooden buildings littered the landscape, most clustered close together as if bracing themselves for a storm. I rubbed my dry fingers together, thinking that there probably hadn't been a real rainstorm here for years. Jake pulled out his gear. A long-range listening sonar dish and headphones. He fiddled with the wires muttering to himself. All the stories say you can hear their stone knees clack together when they walk. If we can catch that sound. With his sonar dish assembled and headphones in place, we began walking through the town. We didn't hear anything for the next hour and a half. Jake had almost given up when his face lit up. Come on, he shouted, taking off between two abandoned houses. I chased after him, my mind more on rusted nails than angry aboriginal spirits. But then I heard it too. A soft clacking sound. I turned a corner to see Jake staring up at a piece of metal swaying from a rope in the wind. It swung and hit the side of a pole, making a distinctive clack. Let's get out of here, he said, disappointment coloring his tone. We walked back to the car. Before I got in, I noticed several long thin scratches crisscrossing the side panel. My mind flashed to the car insurance Jake had said no to. Did we drive to close to some bushes on our way out here? Ryan, Jake said, his voice low. Yeah, I said, trying to contain my annoyance. It was then that I noticed the clacking. It was louder and closer this time. I stood up, turned back towards the town, and saw two dozen pairs of flaming eyes staring out at us from between the houses. Clack. Clack, clack. Clack, clack, clack. The clacking resumed, coming from each pair of eyes. They were getting closer. We jumped into the car and Jake turned the engine over. I shot a look out the windshield. I saw a dozen glowing eyes just a few feet away. Jake slammed the car into reverse, backing down the road, turning around and driving away. I can't think of any other explanation for what we saw. I don't think they wanted us near that town. It was the summer of 2005. A friend of mine, Wayne, and I decided to spend the day fishing at Upper Swadger Lake in the Lost River Mountain Range of Idaho. Visited mostly by the locals, this alpine lake is tucked up on a ridge overseeing two long, dry canyons on opposite sides. It sits just at the top of the tree line, providing an uninhibited view of the sky and surrounding mountain peaks. The fishing is usually pretty good. If you like golden trout, I hate trout. They taste like mud, but I do love fishing. And some of the best, most secluded lake fishing can be found on these high Idaho lakes. Getting to Swadger Lake is not an easy task. It's a 100 mile journey over a lonely highway from the region's largest town, Idaho Falls. When you hit the dirt road turn off, there are miles of four wheel driving up the canyon to the hiking trail. Once at the trailhead, it's a two mile, 1000 foot vertical gain hike up to the lake. But when you finally arrive, surrounded by the bald peaks of the Little Lost Range, it's all worth the effort. 
Arriving at the lake around noon, we spent the day fishing, relaxing, and chatting. Far down in the canyon, out of sight from us, we continually heard periodic loud blasts. Growing up in the rural us, you get accustomed to people target shooting on public land, and that's what we concluded was happening below us. From the sheer thunderousness we guessed it was a large caliber muzzle-loading rifle. The blasts were spaced out long enough that they had to be manually reloading their guns. The shots reverberated and echoed throughout the canyon. Whoever was down there was having a bit of fun with their rifle. Unperturbed by the cacophony down in the canyon we continued fishing, only momentarily reminded of the explosions as they continued to occur throughout the day. The fishing was great and the day seemed to flash by. Before we knew it the sun was cresting on the mountains. We headed back to camp for the night. Wayne had caught his limit towards the end of the day, while I had been releasing mine. We settled down to a campfire and watched the sun sink behind the mountain peaks as Wayne cooked his muddy fish. It was twilight now. Aside from the crackling of the fire it was a quiet evening. The sky was absolutely clear and we watched as the star twinkled into existence in the sky. Our relaxation was interrupted by yet another one of those thunderous explosions. Only this time much closer to us. That was weird. Target shooting is extremely dangerous at night. Whoever was down there in the canyon was being very irresponsible. Wayne nudged me with his elbow and motioned for me to look in the direction of the sound of the last explosion. While not directly visible to us, there was a light down the mountain. It was illuminating the whole canyon. From the angles of the tree shadows we could see the source of the light was not at ground level. It was up high in the air, and it was moving. We watched in bewildered silence as the light moved up the canyon. We still could not get a direct line of sight on it. There was another blast that seemed to shake my skull. The light in the canyon flashed almost a hundred times brighter than before. We could absolutely not make sense of what was happening. As we sat there, unsure of what to do, the light rose upwards out of the canyon. As it crested the trees and continued to rise, we could finally get a direct look. It was a brilliant ball of yellow golden light. Getting a size estimate was difficult, but I figured it was between 20 to 40 feet in diameter. The light rose silently above the canyon and then above our elevation at the lake. It stopped several hundred feet above the surrounding landscape and stayed there. The object's surface shimmered and danced. Little feathers of sparks would periodically jump away from the object and fall down towards the trees below. Wayne looked at me and all I could do was shrug my shoulders and give him a I have no damn idea look. After a few minutes the ball's surface stopped dancing. It was completely still in the air above us. No sound. No movement. With no warning it exploded in a deafening shower of sparks and blinding light. Wayne and I instinctively jumped into the dirt and covered our heads. The light was so bright I felt I could see through my closed eyelids. The explosion shook everything around us. I could feel the shock resonate in the ground beneath me. It was like the world was coming undone at the seams. Then everything was absolutely silent and dark. The whole event could only have been a handful of seconds long, but it felt like hours. When we looked up into the sky, the ball of light was gone. We were left alone in just the dim light of the stars. Picking myself up out of the dirt, all I could say to Wayne was, what in the hell was that all about? He chuckled nervously, but didn't reply. We surveyed the camp and the surrounding area. Nothing seemed damaged or disturbed. There were no signs of fires that were started from the explosion. It was like nothing out of the ordinary had happened. The one thing that was off though was the time. It was late twilight when the light exploded above us. But my watch was showing two o'clock in the morning. Further baffling us was Wayne's fish. They were now charred cinders above a bed of red coals that was once our campfire. I'm well aware of the phenomenon of missing time, but that was not possible. The stupid thing exploded. We hit the dirt. And then we picked ourselves up. Couldn't have been more than a couple minutes from the explosion to us getting up. I didn't have the mental capacity to process what had happened. I headed to my tent and went right to sleep. It was a deep, dreamless sleep. When I awoke the morning sun was illuminating the tent. Wayne was already up and fishing. I asked him about his thoughts on what happened last night, and he simply shrugged and said, 
It either didn't happen, or we saw something we probably shouldn't have. It's that or Marvin the Martian tried to kill us. We fished for a few hours that morning, then decided against camping another night at the lake. We packed up camp and hiked down to our vehicle. This happened almost 20 years ago, and I've been back to Swadger Lake several times over the years. I've never seen or heard anything like what we saw on that night again. I don't have an explanation for what happened and don't believe we ever will. It was 1989 in the Stanislaus National Forest, California. My dad and his friend, myself, and my brother regrouped for lunch to talk about how the deer hunting went. We were all sitting there and all of a sudden a young man in his 20s, holding his rifle ran towards us and scared out of his mind, was yelling, it's after me. He repeated this over and over again. The sound in his voice was primal fear. He never focused on us as he ran past. We got the cue from dad as he reached over and grabbed his 30.06 and chambered around. We were all loaded up and had our heads on a swivel. The young man ran until he was out of sight. He never even considered us as a safe haven or armed hunters. We never saw anything chasing after him, and we never saw him again. I've never seen someone scared out of their mind like that since. It occurred between Long Barn and Cherry Lake. My second experience is strange. It happened just a mile from the other account in the same remote Borland Mountain area trailhead. My 12-year-old son and I went on a night hike. We left the truck at the trailhead and started hiking at 9 p.m. I've done this night hike many times before, and it takes exactly an hour and 30 minutes to get to camp. Just 10 minutes into our hike, I noticed birds flying towards us, not sure why they did this. It was as if they were attracted to the lights or something to scare them towards us. At this time I felt confused because we were no longer standing on the trail. We were somehow in the bushes about 50 feet from the trail. It was as if we had sleepwalked into the bushes and woke up there. We were both perplexed. We finally arrived at our camp. The strange part was we got there at 11.45 p.m. We lost track of over an hour's worth of time. We could not explain what had happened. The third event occurred after I had moved to northern Idaho. I live in a small town, and this happened early in April 2021. This experience shook me to the core. I still don't know what it was I saw. I was talking to my friend on the phone sitting on the porch, and I heard my dog bark her head off. She never barks unless there's a good reason for it. I got up and headed to the side of the barn in a flanking direction while on the phone. I looked and saw her on the other side staring below. I looked in that direction. There was something dark standing there. It was at least eight foot tall. I've lived in the woods all my life and I could not believe my eyes. It was a huge dark shadow hiding behind one of my pine trees. It was a thick dark smoke figure walking upright. My friend heard me say, WTF am I looking at? In that instant, it fled away from me towards a seasonal water drainage and disappeared. As I moved quickly away I yelled, in the name of Jesus you're not welcome here. I don't know why I said that, but I did. After this, my dog came to me, and I noticed all of her fur was standing up. I had never seen her that worked up before. The next day I got the nerve and headed down to the lower property. There were no tracks in the snow. Also, my property is enclosed by five-strand barbed wire fences. Nothing was disturbed. Some strange things are going on here on our planet that no one seems to want to talk. I'll never venture into the woods at night ever again. So my brother is in the army, been gone half a year. I talk to him once a week, and we discuss everything that goes on there and back home. Last week when we last spoke, he told me that one night when him and another cadet were in a foxhole, which is surrounded by deep forest, they heard a sound that could only be described as blood curdling. My brother and I are obsessed with the dogman phenomenon, and everything about the subject. We pick through all the hoaxes and cling on to what could really be true evidence. A while ago I came across a sound clip claiming to be one of the creatures recorded outside of someone's motor home or RV or whatever the story says, and it's really a frightening sound. We've heard many animals where we live, dogs, cats, bear, mountain lion, bobcat, owls, foxes, you name it. 
and this sound doesn't match up to anything known to humankind, a sound that almost sounds pure evil. When I spoke to my brother, he told me about the sound, and said it was almost identical to the sound recorded. The first thing I asked was if anyone else heard it, and that's when he told me his buddy heard it too. My mom, sister, and I were on our way to a baseball game of mine during my junior year of high school. This was in northern New York so spring got a little chilly at times. The main road we took stretched about 35 miles and was nothing but cornfields and tree lines. We hit a stretch of the road that was super foggy for no reason so my mom slowed down to a proper speed. We finally reached the end of the fog and we all looked to the left to see where we were. About 50 yards from the road was a man and woman in what appeared to be wedding clothing from at least 100 years ago man wearing a big top hat and the woman wearing an old looking white dress holding hands with their backs to us walking towards the wood line. We drove past and I just remember the silence in the car until my mom said, WTF was that. To this day whenever we are together and one of us tells the story, we all get goosebumps. Yesterday, a tech was at my house, trying to fix my heat pump. He mentioned he was having a lot of difficulties with it. My dog needed to go outside for a quick walk. I walked her for a short time, and as I was walking back at my driveway, I took a look to make sure the tech's van was still there. Good. I didn't want to have missed him if he had managed to fix it while I was gone. When I was quite close to my home, maybe a 15 second walking distance away, I looked and saw his white van was still there. However, another larger black van was now parked just past his. I could see the back half of it, and the details of it. A guy had gotten out of the van, and I could see the details of him as well. He was wearing jeans, a black jacket, and a black ball cap. He was thin, and young, maybe mid-twenties. He walked down a small hill to get to my basement door, which he opened, and I watched him go in and close the door behind him. I knew the tech was having problems with my heat pump, so I just assumed he had called in a buddy to help him out with the situation. That would be a fairly normal situation around here rural way of working. I glanced down at my dog and looked away for maybe a second or two, and then back at my house. There was no black van, then there, no tech, just the original white van the tech was driving. They obviously couldn't have gone anywhere, I would have heard them and seen them, and it's my driveway. So there was nowhere else they could have gone. No other way out. Besides, the time was just seconds between seeing the van and the young man enter my basement, and it all disappearing in the next moment. I went into my house and told the actual heat pump tech about it, and he was. Rattled lol. So, one night, when I was still living with my father, I had gone downstairs to the kitchen to get some water. While I was filling my glass at the sink, I turned around to find my sister standing in the hallway behind me wearing a plaid onesie and looking down at her phone which was illuminating her face. I hadn't heard her come down the stairs or walk down the hallway, but the house was relatively new so it didn't creak much. I said hi then turned back to the sink to finish filling my glass. I turned back around because she hadn't replied and she was gone. I heard someone going up the stairs quickly and just assumed she'd just come down to see what I was doing. I finished filling my glass then headed back to my room, which I shared with her by the way. Once I got there, I realized she was in bed so I asked if she had been downstairs, she said she hadn't. I thought she was messing with me so I continued to ask and insist that she had been. Eventually, I gave up on trying to get her to confess. I don't remember why but I looked in our closet. Lo and behold, there was the plaid onesie hanging in the closet. This all happened in a matter of a few minutes. It's possible that she really was messing with me, but she seemed just as confused as I was. My story begins on the Long Island Expressway back in December of 2001. I drove a black sedan for a car service from Delaware to JFK Airport in New York. I made the trip dozens of times and knew my way around the side streets on my route. One night around 12 am, I was on my way to JFK when a car exited the two-lane expressway at a standstill. 
I talked to my passenger, let's call him Steve, and decided to take the side streets. We jumped off at Sheepshead Bay and started on our way. We began talking about how creepy the name Sheepshead Bay is when, from out of nowhere, a 1957 Chevy Bel Air appeared. Steve jumped up and threw his arm over the side passenger seat and said, Dude, check out that car. We both looked out the driver's side window as we came to a stop at the red light where we were about to turn right. As the car came to a stop, we continued to stare at the car. It was beautiful. Chrome trim. Red paint. Convertible. It was December. It had to be low 30s. There was a couple in the car both with 50s clothing on. It was a short guy with a brown derby hat and a brown coat. The woman had a scarf draped over her head like a hood. Big round framed glasses and a leather coat. My passenger yells out, nice ride. Both of them turned slowly in unison and looked at us. Black eyes, huge black eyes. We both froze. As the light turned green, while still looking at us, they began to make a left turn. We sat there stunned as the car drove north towards Manhattan. While still a bit stunned, we make the right turn. Not a word was said between me and Steve. He slumps back in his seat and says, what the hell was that? I had no answer. We continued down the road where I saw that the expressway was open so we jumped on the ramp and we were back on course. As we entered the expressway I could see the blue lights of emergency vehicles in the distance behind us. We were on the expressway alone. No other traffic ahead or behind us. It looked like smooth sailing from here on out. Steve, at that point, was still shaken, and he climbed back to the front and hopped into the passenger seat. We started talking about what just happened when I could see the headlights approaching in the rearview mirror. The first thing I thought was, I must have been speeding. I moved to the right lane and basically waited for the blue lights of a patrol car to come on so I could find a place to pull off since there was no shoulder to pull onto. All of a sudden the headlights moved to the right. I can't believe it I yelled the car. It just jumped over the curb onto the sidewalk and began to pass us on the right. Guess who? The black eyed couple was back. They passed us at over a hundred miles per hour. We looked over and with telephone poles flashing between us, the driver looked at us his eyes were glossy black and again without taking his eyes off of us, he floated back onto the expressway and rockets out of sight. I say float because the car never actually jolted as they jumped the curb and passed us. It just kind of slid onto the sidewalk. We continued down the expressway until we reached the airport. We didn't say a lot to each other as he got out of the car and grabbed his bag. Before he walked away he said Sheepshead Bay is a really creepy name for a neighborhood. It was the fall of 1998. I suddenly found myself separated from my husband, and with two preteen children to support. Living in a small Kansas town, there was very limited employment options. I needed to remain close to home to attempt to keep a handle on preteen adolescence, and still keep a roof over our heads. It was convenient when I saw an ad for workers at our local Walmart. The store was converting to a superstore and needed staff 24-7. So I applied. I got hired on as a department manager. I got dug in. I laid out the department and everything on the shelves on the day of the opening, including the shelves themselves, was put there by my two hands. The new store opened and school had started so I tried to keep my hours mostly to accommodate that, but weekend work was mandatory. Usually, I got to work early, there was only light register staff, and I'd be the first department manager on the floor. It was early days for the new store, but the majority of the setup crew had departed the job site. One morning I arrived even earlier than usual. I had timed in and was just about to leave the freight room when a young boy, about the age of my own two kids, rushed past me, nearly knocking me over. He started sputtering something about how his ID had been lost, and he had to see CCTV to see who picked it up. The first thing weird about this is that I didn't know this kid. My kids grew up in this town and being a small town, I thought I knew all the kids from town and all parts around. The second weird thing was, back in 1998, it would be very unusual for any small town preteen to have an ID of any kind. I told him I knew nothing about it, but he could follow me back to the office to inquire. There was only one lady back in the office. 
She was a member of the setup team and had been responsible for hiring me. I left him with her after a short explanation and went out on the floor to begin my day. But I had forgotten my scanner. So I turned my heel and went back into the office area to get one. Immediately I could hear this kid becoming very aggressive with my coworker. He was ranting on, insisting that he view the CCTV tape immediately. The human resources officer was trying to calmly explain to him that only security staff and the store manager could view it, and she would pass on his concern. Worried about my coworker's safety, I crept closer to the door, which remained open. His back was to me, but looking past him I could clearly see her white and shocked face. The boy, sensing my presence, swung around and stormed past me, and I assume, flew out of the building. Did you see his eyes? She exclaimed. Though in fact I had, I said nothing. I think I was basically gobsmacked. And as it turned out, I never again spoke to her. That was the last time I saw her. When I inquired after her, I was told she was transferred, though others whispered that she had been fired by the home office. The third weird thing was, look into the eye of a snake, and you will know what I saw as the boy fled by me. You are welcome to use this story, but please do not use my name. This is a true story and detailed to the best of my memory. Thank you, Jay. A 50 female bought a house almost three years ago in Northern Maryland. Property is over two acres with a spring creek running through it and a 120 year old farmhouse atop a hill. Rest of the original property had been divided years ago and there are McMansions around our quiet haven. More than an acre is fenced and landscaped. The rest is a bit wild with plenty of wildlife moving around. A few months after we moved in, my daughter 30 came for the weekend. We had piled a bunch of lawn debris and dead wood at the bottom of the hill near the creek, but inside the fence to have a bonfire for the grandkids. They had gone to bed after s'mores and my so stayed in the house with them. Daughter and I sat by the fire and chatted for a while. I felt like we were being watched just a mental ping but not menacing. I see across the creek, about 30 yards away, a perfect white circle that looked to be about 15-18 across. Then I realized it had a very thin, dark body, average height, behind the tree it was leaning against. I'm a calm person and asked my daughter if she could see it as well. She said yes, and we quietly got up and walked toward the house. Checked the next day and saw nothing unusual where it had been. Never saw it again, but also didn't go looking. Several weeks ago, daughter reported seeing it again on this side of the creek. Last week she was FaceTiming a friend who also saw it just within the yard. No idea what it is, but not comfortable with it getting closer to the house. In retrospect, not sure if the white circle is part of it, or just a cover so we couldn't see the face. Any ideas? I had an experience last night. My sister and I were out on the back porch with the dogs when our sheep, which we keep in a yard right next to the dogs, started running around like they were being chased. I thought maybe our herding dog, who we keep in the barn about a half mile down the road, had gotten down here somehow and was bothering them, so I turned on my phone's flashlight. The sheep were huddled in a corner near the dogs at this point and I didn't see anything, and after waiting a few minutes the dog didn't start chasing them again, so I turned off my flashlight. A bit after I did they started running again, so I turned my light back on and again saw nothing. Turned it back off, and they ran back to their original corner. This continued for a bit until one time when my light was off, and I saw a curly black dog's tail silhouetted against our white truck. Aha, problem solved. That's exactly what our herding dog's tail looks like, so obviously it's her. At this point I turned my light back on didn't see her and kept it on. I called her name and she didn't come, which was a bit weird she's a very obedient dog, even if she does get excited and overheard the sheep. I kept calling her name, and then eventually the sheep ran from the corner they were in and across the yard again. I hadn't seen the dog scare them. But whatever, they were near the edge of the yard where a relatively small border collie could easily hide in the shadows. The sheep kept running to and from different corners as if being spooked, and I kept just missing. The dog getting to where she could scare them in the direction they ran. Actual weird stuff, then it started getting a little weird. 
The sheep ran back to the corner near the dodge yard, and this time I saw a black llama shape again partially silhouetted by the car where I thought I saw the dog's tail earlier. We have a black baby llama in that yard so I thought, oh, she's chasing the sheep. She's always been very friendly with the sheep and calm, unlike our grown llama who is not in that yard, but maybe she learned from the adult. But then this is the unexplainable part the sheep ran from that again, fully illuminated corner they were in. I didn't see the llama do anything to scare them in fact, I can't see her anymore, but okay. But then the sheep ran from their new corner, as if the llama chased them from there too, when there is no way she could have gotten to that corner without me seeing her. Llamas are big. At this point I can clearly hear the llama's hoofbeats and have no idea how I ever thought it was a dog chasing them. But this is hilarious. Our sweet llama terrorizing the sheep in the middle of the night, so I pull out my camera and record. I can't see the llama on screen at all, but she's black, so I guess the phone just isn't picking her up even with the flash. The sheep keep running across this same stretch of grassy area, presumably chased by the llama. I can't see her chasing them which is odd since she's so big, but that side of the yard's darker so I'm probably just overlooking her. But then, the sheep ran again, and this time directly across a completely clear area and into a corner that's just dirt. That's great. Even if it was a squirrel chasing them, I'll be able to see it this time. But then, they run from that corner, and I see absolutely no other animal. Definitely not the llama, not even a raccoon. Nothing could have gotten in that corner to scare them back out without me seeing it. Plus now that I'm looking around the yard to see what I missed I see the llamas in the very back. There's a small chute that leads to more of the yard which the sheep never went into, and I would have seen the llama leave. What the f? Then after the sheep stop in a new corner I hear hoofbeats. These hoofbeats are loud. Hella loud. And fast. They sound like a horse galloping. At this point I freak out because there's no way a horse got in there, and I didn't see it. Both of our horses are red, unlike the dog and the llama. So that's it. No way am I doing this. I go inside the house and bring the dogs with me. Don't go back out the rest of the night. I went down to the barn this morning, and the horses and the dog were all in there, no holes in the fences, no way they could have gotten out and back in. Now these are very calm sheep. We specifically have them down here instead of at the barn because they won't get spooked by the dogs. They're the old sheep. They're not prone to getting spooked or running around for no reason, and in fact are quite lazy again old. The places they were running from made it clear that whatever was chasing them was in the yard. Not outside of it, sometimes they would run from the center of the yard. The yard they're in is small the size of a suburban home's backyard. My flashlight illuminated everywhere they ran, except for the very edges, which again weren't the only places they were running from. We have a new strong fence keeping them in that a wild animal couldn't get through, unless it was very small squirrel sized, maybe raccoon or literally broke the fence down. It is not broken down, and the animal that I saw or heard at the end was clearly larger than even the sheep. It looked the size of our grown mama who is not in that yard and sounded like one of our horses galloping. Anyway, help explainable, something supernatural. I live on the very southern edge of Killeen, Texas. I am surrounded by huge ranches in the country. A couple months ago, I was on my way to the nearest gas station to grab a couple of beers for the night, and it is a little over four miles to get around the ranch I live by to get to the gas station. It's central Texas, with scrub oaks, cedars, cacti, yuccas, and such, so it's hilly and scrubby, but has its open areas. Anyway, about the midpoint of my trip, I get to a stop sign, turn left, and go up this hill. I'm accelerating and keep looking down at the speedometer to check my speed. I finally get to speed, turn on the cruise control so I don't have to worry about it, and then I go back to paying attention to my surroundings. There are a few things that bother me with this story, and it's why I've held off submitting it. As I crested the hill, still on my way to get some beer, I saw a glimmer man. Plain and simple. I only noticed it as I crested the hill. It was on the left side of the road. It seemed to be upright, but quickly squatted to all four and ran across the road. I don't really think it was a man though. I first noticed movement off to my left, actually on the left shoulder, it was a two-lane road. 
What I then saw was a figure. It squatted to all fours. It galloped across the road and crossed it in three gallops. It moved like it was bipedal, but was moving on all four. It seemed to be made of water, but a softer water, if that makes sense, and it was huge. I'm six foot tall, and it made me feel small. It was around two in the afternoon when this occurred. I think what I saw was the light reflecting off of the figure. That's how I was able to see it. Two other things bother me about this and make me question myself. They are. One. The thing I saw, well, looked like a dogman. Well that, or the creature from the alien film franchise. I saw many teeth, long, muscular limbs, a slender torso, and what seemed to be pointed ears, but they were laid back. I saw the teeth, head, body, and limbs which were distorted because they were moving so fast. I'm not going to lie. If I would have had something in my bladder, I'd have soiled myself. I still haven't come to terms with it. 2. This exact same spot, not area, but spot, my grandson was in the back of my jeep. We were going to the same gas station. I had the top and doors off, which gives you a pretty good view of everything. So while traveling through this same spot, my grandson said he saw a kangaroo. This was approximately two years prior. I spent several months after his comment, scouring the area as I drove through, looking for a kangaroo. I've had no luck spotting one yet. Now that I'm retired from the army, I've met people from everywhere. One of my close friends from Jay, Texas used to have wallabies as pets when he was a kid. So not out of the realm of imagination. However, it's goats, cattle and horses around here because the land is so rough. I kept close watch through there for months afterward to see if I could spot it. All I saw were road runners, turkeys, deer and such. I have no clue what he could have seen. However, after much reflection, the only thing I can think of is the backward knees and upright stature. Maybe that's why he called it a kangaroo. My grandson was seven years old at the time. Since my sighting, I'll go to the gas station to grab a beer and bring my dog with me. She's a Great Dane or Catahoula mix and really just looks like a huge hound dog. Anyway, the first couple of times I took her through that very area, she'd go nuts as if she'd smelled something. She'd run back and forth from one side to the other. The third time, last week, she started growling when we went through there. I still didn't see anything but the area where she growled was the same place where the aforementioned instances occurred. I don't know what to make of it and haven't said anything to anyone. I'm just wondering what y'all think of it, or am I just going crazy and paranoid? Okay, might not be as exciting or intriguing as most posts on here, but here goes. When I was younger I lived in a terraced, Victorian brick house on the side of a hill. One Saturday afternoon my dad and I were watching TV when we heard this swishing or blowing noise approaching from outside. At first it sounded like it might have been some electric vehicle like a milk float, but it got more and more bassy, deeper as it got louder, and then we heard it, along with very slight vibrations passing beneath the house. We looked at each other, startled and confused, and at that point it ended fairly abruptly. I've racked my brains for this for years, but even now, I'm completely stumped. We were on a narrow street with cars going past semi-regularly. It sounded nothing like a, any sort of vehicle I've ever heard. Plus, despite it first sounding like it was outside, it definitely ended up being something occurring beneath the house, and it sounded quite deep. I'm thinking tectonic activity of some kind, maybe. I'd love to figure out what caused this phenomenon, and to even hear that sound again, but googling turns up nothing. Anyway, like I said, not a majorly exciting happening, but something I finally wanted to post somewhere. A few years back, we were having a brutally cold winter. The snow had frozen into ice and covered everything. It was pitch black in the backyard when I went to let my dog outside one last time before bed that evening. As we exited the house from the sliding door of the walkout basement and onto the lower deck, I felt that something was off. Our house backs up to some woods, so I was accustomed to hearing noises from wildlife in the night. This night was different. Nothing made a sound except the arctic cold wind but I had the feeling I was being watched. The entire time my dog was in the backyard, I looked around nervously, expecting a coyote or other predator to pop out of the tree line. 
My dog did his business, but afterwards stopped and stared at a corner of the woods until I got creeped out and called him back inside. I quickly locked the sliding door and shut the curtains, unable to shake the uneasy feeling I had outside. After double and triple checking all the locks in the house, I went to bed. Around three in the morning, I hear the muffled sound of my dog barking from the basement two floors below. I got up, stumbled down three flights of stairs, and found him standing at the basement sliding door. He was peeking his head through the closed curtains, barking his head off with the hairs standing up all along his back. I tried calling him away from the door, but he wouldn't let up. I dreaded peeking out the curtain to see what he was barking at, after the uneasy feeling I had earlier in the night. Finally, I held my breath and swiped the curtain aside. I peered into the inky blackness, but saw nothing to cause any alarm. A wave of relief washed over me. I figured it must have been a deer or a raccoon in the yard that set him off. He whined at the door for a few more minutes until I bribed him upstairs with a dog cookie. I went back to bed and wasn't disturbed again. That is, until the morning when I went to the basement to let out the dog. I opened the sliding door and walked out onto the deck as he bounded into the snow. My blood ran as cold as the sub-zero morning temperatures when I looked down. There, frozen into the ice on the deck, was a set of bare human footprints. They were very clear. I could make out each toe on the person's foot. The prints were large and appeared to be from an adult male. Looking around, I noticed they started at the base of the deck went to the sliding door in the window of the basement living room, then seemed to disappear off the side of the deck. I had my snow boots on, so I walked around the yard, but I could find no trace of the footprints in the snow once they left the deck. Keep in mind the daily temperatures that winter barely made it above zero F, and the wind chill made it feel close to 20 below. Frostbite would set in within a matter of minutes for anyone walking around barefoot, especially in the dead of night. I never experienced anything like that again, but I did adopt a second dog shortly thereafter. This was about ten years ago with my boyfriend, who is now my husband in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. His mom is a big-time hiker and was part of a hiking club that got awesome discounts on these very rustic cabins run by the state park. We decided to spend a weekend at one of them. The hike wasn't super far, probably a mile or so. Cabin was very bare bones. It had a deck off the back, so we were hanging out back there when we heard it. To this day, it was the strangest thing and so hard to describe. The sound was that of someone dropping something like a basketball. Thumps that progressively became closer and closer and closer together. Like when a ball gets closer and closer to the ground. The weirdest part was the sense of vibration that seemed to come from below us and or inside us. The first time it happened, we were weirded out, but I thought maybe there was something underneath the deck or the house, like a boiler or furnace. Even though there was no heat, that was being weird, so we went down to check it out. And there was nothing, and then it happened again. A couple more times, and we got so scared we ran back inside and considered leaving. No one we've ever talked to has described something similar. Truly one of the weirdest things I've encountered. My family spent many summer camping. On one trip, my brother and I, seven and ten years old respectively, were hiking with our parents at a state campground. We stopped because my parents wanted to scout out the trail ahead, which was actually going down a somewhat steep hill. As my brother and I stood at the top of the hill waiting, we looked at our feet and realized we were standing in a nest of bees that had made their home in the ground. It took us a moment to realize what was happening, and then we took off running screaming, but we were already being attacked. Our parents gave chase and swatted the bees away, but we were both stung at least 15, 20 times. It was a pretty traumatic experience at the time. Today I have no fear of bees or the outdoors, though. Beyond that, probably seeing my youngest daughter bite it hard while we were on a bike ride whilst camping. She was a real trooper, though, and carried on once she got cleaned up. I've camped all over the country in a lot of the biggest national parks. 
Places like Yellowstone, where there are no humans for tens or twenties of miles, if not solid thirty or more miles. And if something happened to you, you're pretty much ruined, and you will die. We decided to do a quick overnight camp in the woods, at least ten or fifteen miles away from any towns or cabins deep in the woods, while visiting two harbors, Minnesota. We drove way the F out into the woods in the Boundary Waters area where there are roads on maps, but it's really two depression tracks in there, ground like parallel goat trails made from four times fours driving through the woods over the years. This was in the fall, just as leaves started to change, and some had fallen, but maybe half were still on the branches. The only way we knew where we were going was by GPS and the goat tracks. We finally got lost and the branches of trees had canopied over the trail and weeds were whacking the side of my jeep as we kept driving, enjoying not being in a normal place. We found a space barely open enough to walk around the jeep, but not really big enough for a tent, but I was sick of driving. I shut the engine off and we were treated to the sounds of nothing but nature, and it was clear there were no humans for a very long ways away, just the wind and occasionally a crow. That's it. We decided to camp there in the jeep because there wasn't enough of a clearing to put the tent out. It was a beautiful afternoon and then evening, and we used a small propane tank grill to make dinner and late afternoon coffee. After dark, it got cold, so we hopped in the jeep and zipped up for the evening. Sometime around 3 a.m., I woke up from a noise. I couldn't quite tell if I dreamt it or it was real. I sat up and could hardly see out of the jeep windows, and it had grown much colder than when we went to bed. The windows were frosted about halfway up in an irregular jagged pattern. I sat up for maybe ten minutes, and since the noise was gone, I figured we were good to go back to sleep, or I was anyways. My wife never woke up. I checked the door locks, and since they were unlocked, I hit the lock button on my fob and went back to sleep. The next morning, I woke up to my wife saying, F, it snowed. A lot. She was looking out the top of the window from the back of the Cherokee where it wasn't frozen. I sat up and looked out the side window. It looked like we got a foot of snow. I wiggled out of the sleeping bag and opened the door and saw the snow was indeed about a foot deep. I could clearly see this because there were boot footprints in the snow. I was confused at first and wondered where they came from then. Remembered the came from then, remembered the noise. I closed the door and told my wife what happened. She said... F, I've got to pee. Go check it out so I can pee. So I dug my boots out of the foot, well put them on and hopped out. It had stopped snowing a couple times. The boot prints circled around the jeep and clearly stopped to look in the windows. They appeared to come from behind us and continued forever down the path ahead of us without circling back. I walked a bit in both directions before my wife shouted to not go that far away, and could she take a piss? From out the cracked door, I shouted, yeah, and she did. I don't know why, but I was surprised to find no other animal tracks, car tracks, horse tracks, nothing, just boot prints. I walked back to the jeep, pissed off to the side myself, and when the wife finished pissing, I asked her if she was messing with me. She looked at me as if I was the stupidest person to have walked the face of the earth. No. Then she got in the jeep. I did too. The clock on the dash said it was 8.15 in the morning. I looked at my phone, charging from the plug on the dash, and had no signal. I started the jeep and started the jeep and started the jeep and started the navigation on the dash, and I said, let's get the fuff out of here. We sat there waiting forever for the GPS to activate on the navigation system. It wasn't so much that the thick overhead clouds were blocking the GPS, it usually does okay with cloud cover. It was the fact that we had a billion trees leaning over the road like a heavy snowed on canvas, bouncing the GPS away combined with the weaker GPS signal from the clouds. At least that's what I thought. The map just did nothing and was blank. Eventually, I set a fit and put the Jeep in four-wheel low, turned it around and followed the path of the boot prints that were behind because I couldn't see the twin goat tracks that made up the road the night before, and it was hard to tell where the trail led other than the boot tracks. It was slow going because of the higher snow and the front of the jeep acted as a plow. Eventually the boot tracks faded away. 
I guessed it was because the boot track maker had been walking while it snowed and it stopped snowing halfway out to where we were in the woods, which is why we could follow six or seven miles back through the woods. Sort of like driving backwards through time if you get my meaning. Anyways, it meant he had started walking or continued to walk while it snowed in the darkest night in the woods, in the middle of ducking nowhere before stumbling on our jeep. The GPS came back on not long after we got to the end of his trail, as the canopy of trees got further back from the goat tracks. And we were relieved to see the wooded goat tracks. And we were relieved to see the wooded goat trail became a gravel road, not much further down the way. Plus, it was much easier to drive on the gravel road as there was already one set of tire tracks in the direction we were going. Still not sure how long the boot tracks stood outside the jeep watching us that night, or if the noise was her, him opening and closing the unlocked door, or just walking around outside the jeep in the snow. That's the creepiest thing I've experienced. I love camping. The more remote, the better. One night I was camping in northwest Alabama near a small river but up on a hill away from the water. It was a nice level spot with a huge oak tree above and a thick layer of leaves below. I set up my tent and fixed a sandwich, then settled in to watch the stars for a bit before falling asleep. The tent flap was zipped but it was a small tent so my head was up against the fabric on one side. I had carefully built a fire pit about ten feet from the tent with a small fire that was gradually going down to ashes. I woke up with something trying to bite my head through the tent. Whatever it was clamped down just enough that I could feel the teeth as they raked across my skin. The tent fabric kept it from getting a good hold of me. Now I'm a person who reacts to danger by going all-out aggressive so my response was to let out the deepest, most guttural growl of my life. Whatever it was, noped out of there so fast it left skid marks in the leaves. I'm kind of glad it left as the only weapon I had was a kitchen knife. I got up and threw some wood on the remnants of the fire and stoked up a good blaze, then sat in the tent reading until dawn. I am a park ranger responsible for keeping the peace and ensuring the safety of all visitors in the National Park. It was a beautiful day in the park, but little did I know that I was about to have the encounter of a lifetime. It was a calm and peaceful day in the park until I heard strange noises coming from a nearby clearing. I cautiously approached and was shocked to see a large, Bigfoot-like creature. I had heard about these creatures before, but I never expected to actually see one in real life. I immediately called for backup and within minutes... A team of park rangers arrived on the scene. We were all in awe of the massive creature, but we knew we had to act quickly. We tried to get as close as possible to the Bigfoot, but it suddenly became aggressive and started attacking us. We quickly realized that we were no match for the creature and were forced to call in the government for help. A team of government agents arrived, armed with advanced weapons and technology, but the Bigfoot was still too powerful. Despite their efforts, the creature managed to escape into the wilderness. The government declared a state of emergency and a massive search and rescue operation was launched to find and capture the Bigfoot. They had to act fast as it was becoming clear that the creature posed a serious threat to public safety. Weeks passed and the government finally managed to track down the Bigfoot. A team of highly trained agents confronted the creature, but things quickly took a tragic turn. The Bigfoot was cornered and, in a desperate act of self-defense, attacked the agents. The resulting violence was devastating, and Bigfoot was killed. The news of the attack and the tragic ending to the Bigfoot quickly spread, causing outrage among the public. People were shocked that such a magnificent creature had been killed, and many felt that it was a waste of a unique and valuable life. As a park ranger, I was deeply saddened by the outcome of the incident. I couldn't help but wonder what could have been done differently to prevent such a tragedy. I realize that we still have much to learn about these creatures, and that it's important to protect and preserve their habitats in order to ensure their survival. In the end, the tragedy of the Bigfoot was a wake-up call for all of us. It reminded us that we need to be more mindful of the impact that we have on the natural world and to work towards a more harmonious relationship with the creatures that share our planet. 
I will never forget the encounter that changed my life and the tragic end to the Bigfoot. It will always be a reminder of the importance of preserving and protecting our natural resources and wildlife. Backpacking slash camping with my family of four near a river in a remote canyon in very wild area last summer was quite blissful until waking up around 2 a.m. to a very distressing sound. We were sleeping in our hammocks. Very close to the river and about 40 feet behind us was a tall canyon wall. The sound made me think of an injured animal that was very cat-like. It was coming from behind us towards the wall of the canyon. It was regular, occurring like clockwork every 15, 20 seconds. We shined flashlights and spoke very loudly in hopes of frightening it away from us. There was no moon out and we could see very little but shining our flashlights around. Revealed nothing as well. It sounded so very close. Our efforts did not work at all and it seemed relentless and unfazed by us in every way. I worried it was rabid or hurt. At one point I heard it near the river on the other side of us and was incredibly confused as to how it was able to move around without us hearing it. I sat on the edge of my hammock until dawn with my knife in hand waiting for a wild, sick animal to come out of the bushes at any moment, and I have to fight for our lives. Finally, around dawn, the sounds got less frequent and eventually stopped. After hiking out, we googled many different animal sounds, and the closest we could find to what we were hearing was a mountain lion mating call. Definitely lions in that area, so I believe that's what we heard. Still confused as to why it stayed so very close to us and was not scared away as most wild animals would be. We have seen black bear in this area many times, and they have always run the other way on seeing humans and cats are even more elusive. My buddies and I take a canoe camping trip every year where we camp on some islands on the river for a couple nights. First night was a perfectly clear night. Had a great time hanging out but knew there was a threat of a storm the next night, so we spent some of the night trying to figure out do we paddle all the way back the next day or set up camp further down the river. We decided the latter the next morning because the forecast kept pushing the storm back as the day went on. We get to camp, set up, and get dinner going. As dinner is finishing up, the storm appears over the mountains across the river, so we all huddle in the tent. The most violent wind and rain I've ever experienced we had to hold our tent walls up because they were being caved in by the wind. We're all thinking of a tree falls on us. We're all done. Storm lasts about 40 minutes, and then it's done. Campsite was not flooded by the river, but was just flooded by the rain. Killed the rest of the night, and we just all went to bed at like 8 p.m. Woke up and canoe the rest of the way back the next morning to find about a half mile down the river trees had been blown over and fallen uphill. No confirmation that it was, but we think we missed a macro or micro burst by about a half mile. I am a park ranger at Yosemite National Park, and it is my privilege to patrol this stunning piece of nature. The rolling hills, the towering cliffs, the still waters and the lush forests. All of it makes this place an outdoor enthusiast's paradise. The park is well known for its famous landmarks such as Half Dome and El Capitan, as well as its diverse wildlife, from the majestic deer to the busy squirrels. However, there's one thing in particular that I've been keeping an eye on for a while now, a rumored dark bigot. My name is Daryl, and I've been a park ranger at Yosemite for over 10 years now. Today, I'm on patrol, and I'm determined to uncover the truth about this dark Bigfoot. Some say it's a monster that roams the park at night, Others claim it's just a myth. I've always been skeptical, but I've heard things, strange sounds in the dead of night, reports of missing hikers, whispers of something big and dark lurking in the shadows. I can feel a mystery unfolding, and I'm not one to back down from a challenge. As I make my way deeper into the park, I come across a group of hikers who claim to have seen the dark Bigfoot. They're shaken and frightened, and I do my best to calm them down. I take their statement and promise to look into the matter. It's then that I realize that I'm not the only one trying to uncover the truth about this creature. I meet a young woman named Sarah, 
who's a wildlife photographer. She's here to capture the beauty of Yosemite, but she's also on a mission to find the dark Bigfoot. We team up and spend the next few days exploring the park together. As we search for answers, I find myself falling for Sarah. She's smart, brave, and beautiful, and I can't help but feel a strong connection to her. However, just when I think I've found love, my world comes crashing down. Sarah betrays me, revealing that she's not who she says she is. She's actually working for a group of poachers who are after the dark Bigfoot. They believe that the creature is worth a fortune, and they're willing to do anything to get their hands on it. I'm heartbroken and angry, and I vow to stop them at all costs. The night of the showdown arrives, and I find myself face to face with the dark Bigfoot. It's a monster, a beast unlike anything I've ever seen. The poachers are closing in and I'm outnumbered, but I won't give up. I fight with everything I have, but I'm no match for the dark Bigfoot. In the end, I pay the ultimate price. But I'm at peace knowing that the creature is safe and that Yosemite will remain protected. As I take my last breath, I see Sarah standing over me, tears streaming down her face. She realizes too late the error of her ways and she's filled with regret. The dark Bigfoot disappears into the night, taking its secrets with it. But I hope that one day someone will uncover the truth about this mysterious creature and continue to protect the beauty of Yosemite National Park. When I was 15, my parents made the decision that they wanted to build their own farmhouse in the southern pasture, doing away with the mistakes our old house had and improving on a few concepts. I, being the mountain boy I was, was ecstatic. I no longer had to drudge half a mile to my trap line a mile down, a mile back, and a half a mile to the house, and get ready for school. Trapline would be 200 yards from my front door. All big projects start somewhere, and ours started with water. See, we always had problems with iron water at our old house. It stained everything, changed how food tasted, and God forbid you had anything white. So Dad borrowed a bulldozer and an excavator off of a friend for a few days, built a sturdy road down to the bottoms, and dug footers for the house. But first we had to see if we could get a good well on the property. It's well known that a certain sect of my family could witch water and had an old drilling truck, but first, silver had to cross hands, a jug of good shine had to be shared, and the rest poured out afterwards, and me and my sister would see if we also had the gift. My cousins came down and checked the land with three things, a fresh-forked peach limb, a pure silver pocket watch, and finally a set of heavy copper wires bent into an L. The peach limbs marked the prospects, the watch pool told the depth of the water, and the copper told of its purity. Us kids had to stay up on the hill till they were done, and one by one we were called down and instructed how to find water and mark it. My sister was down there about half an hour, and then I got the call. When I went down I was given four flags, instructed how to do it, and set out with a peach limb. Where it pulled the hardest, I marked the spots while my dad and the cousins looked on from the truck. I was next given the pocket watch and told to tell them which one pulled the hardest. After that, I was given the copper tines and told to tell which one crossed the quickest. After much testing, I came up with the one weaving down through our sugar maple patch where we made maple syrup. Well, apparently I was dead on and was congratulated by all attending of my gift. But I digress, on to the creepy part. The next day, they brought the rig up, trimmed some trees so they could stand it up, and started drilling on my spot. At 50 feet, they hit water unexpectedly. Short job, right? Well, Dad had talked them into drilling a few holes in the creek through the bedrock, so he could blast a few big holes in the creek for trout and a swimming hole. Well, he had already cleared out a road down to the creek and cleaned off a section of bedrock, diverted the creek to the other side, and prepped them a spot to drill. The creek is probably 30 feet wide from bank to bank, and is easily crossed dry-footed in dog days, but never goes completely dry. Well, they take the rig down, drive it through the pasture, turn it around and back it out on the bedrock. Dad took the dozer and was clearing off a section on the other side of the pasture. 
and I was watching him for about an hour or two when my cousins come running up to my dad, yelling for him to come and pull them back up the bank. They ain't drilling any more holes in the damned creek bed. Some words were exchanged, and dad backed the dozer down, hooked up to the rig, and dragged them back into the pasture. The weirdest thing was, they then set up the rig 50 yards from the creek and started drilling a test hole. When they got about four lengths down, they pulled it up and went back another 50 yards and drilled another, finally satisfied in what was going on. I, on the other hand, had walked around them and walked down to the creek to where they had just drilled. See? Dad couldn't turn all the creek against the hillside. Not enough backfill and too much bedrock. What I seen was a drill hole down through the rock with a small stream of water disappearing in it. Come to find out, they had hit an underground cavern at six feet, and it just went. It extended about fifty yards out into our pasture, and maybe another forty yards beyond that. We had to rearrange where we were putting the house it came so far. We went back down to the creek with a tape measure. The tape measure maxed out, so we got a one hundred feet tape and put it down. It maxed out. Got a spool of baler's twine, tied a rock to it, put it into the hole. We all sat there for half an hour while Dad fed twine down into that hole off that spool. Finally, he said for it and cut the twine. It's too damn deep, he said. He gingerly drove the dozer back into the creek and smoothed everything up, covering the hole, and that was it. Dad passed away seven years ago this October. I walked down to the creek and fished it this spring for a mess of brookies. The creek changed and scraped itself clean in a few sections this spring. One of the places it scraped clean was the bedrock where the hole is. Water is still flowing down that hole. It never filled up. I think I had a first-hand encounter with a humanoid being four years ago. As far as I can tell, nothing happened to us. We were not abducted or harmed in any way. But we were very startled, and I would almost say I startled the creature as much as it did us. It was nighttime, and I was at my boyfriend's apartment, hanging out in the bedroom, laying on the bed chatting, watching TV. His roommates were out of town. After a while, I hopped off the bed to use the bathroom. I was just being silly and dramatic for no reason, and swung the bedroom door open all the way very quickly. All the lights in the apartment were off at the time except for the bedroom. As I started to take a step out, my body froze as I felt a presence. I took a second or so for my eyes to adjust and see that maybe five feet or so in front of me stood a humanoid figure with its arms in the air sort of crouched at the knees, staring back at me, like how people put their hands up when they have been startled. Its eyes were huge black saucers, and its head was almost frog-shaped with a small mouth, gaped open. It took me a second to realize what I was looking at, and once I did, I said, oh shit. The second the words left my mouth, the figure shook its arms side to side very fast and accelerated into a blur that went sideways phasing through the wall and disappeared. I immediately closed the door as fast as I could and stood there a moment to calm down and catch my breath. I was trying to rationalize thinking I had just hallucinated the whole thing because I stood up too quickly. My boyfriend kept asking me what just happened, and I just kept saying I stood up too quickly and I was fine and tried to drop the subject. After a second, I felt calm enough and I went to use the bathroom because it was basically an emergency at that point, so I ran off and came back after I was done. My boyfriend was still very shaken up when I returned from the bathroom and was holding his phone, trying to record the hallway as I walked into the doorway, asking me again what just happened. At this point, I knew we both saw something, because why would he be trying to record the hallway? So I asked him to describe to me what he thought happened before I explained my side. And sure enough, he essentially saw this humanoid figure standing in the hall with a similar description and zip out of sight, just like I had seen. After the incident, I thought what I encountered was some type of ghost or demon. I had nightmares about it because I was so shaken. Having another witness really made the reality of the situation set in. After a lot of reflection, therapy, and lurking on this community, I have started to believe it was possibly an ET of some sort or interdimensional being. If anyone is interested, 
I'd be happy to share more details. To this day, I have not had anything quite like that happen again, and I have never met or heard of another person with an encounter quite like mine. I can draw a picture if anyone is interested in trying to identify. Edit, I went ahead and did a drawing of what I saw. I know that it probably looks absolutely stupid, but I guess that's a big reason why I stopped thinking it was a demon. I had always loved working as a park ranger at Shenandoah National Park. The beauty and tranquility of the park made it an extraordinary place to spend my days. One evening, my colleague and friend, Mark, and I were assigned to investigate a fence breach alarm. Park rangers often had to deal with a variety of potential hazards, and the alarm could signal anything from a fallen branch to a dangerous animal or even criminal activity. As Mark and I headed towards the fence, we speculated about what could have caused the breach. When we arrived at the scene, we found a massive tear in the fence, as if something enormous had burst through it. We exchanged nervous glances, knowing this was no ordinary situation. We decided to wait for backup before venturing further. As we stood there, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. I spotted a large, muscular, wolf-like creature entering the park through the breach. I nudged Mark and pointed towards the creature. It appeared to challenge us, grinning menacingly, and its eyes locked onto ours. My heart pounded in my chest as we realized that we were dealing with something we had never encountered before. Before we could react, the creature lunged at Mark, who tried to fend it off with his flashlight. It swiped at him with a clawed paw, leaving a deep gash on his arm. Mark cried out in pain, and I struggled to find my voice to call for help. But, as quickly as it had attacked, the creature turned and walked away, leaving me shaken and terrified. My friend was unconscious. I tried to wake him up. He didn't move. His heart stopped beating. The encounter left me with the unnerving feeling that we had seen something not of this world. I agreed never to share the story, fearing disbelief and ridicule from my peer. The memory of that night haunted me, and I couldn't shake the feeling that the creature was still out there, lurking in the shadows of Shenandoah National Park. During a field school in northern Alabama, we lived in a tent city situated in a patch of woods at the top of a bluff overlooking a slough off the Tennessee River. We had those old-fashioned military-style frame tents and cots. Pretty cushy camping, relatively speaking, but if you're going to live in a tent for six weeks, it might as well be comfortable. We'd hear coyotes at night and see coppermouths and water moccasins on the regular. But nothing was as terrifying as the nighttime thunderstorms. I normally love a good storm, but I've never been as scared as I was that summer when the storms would come through and the wind would whip across the cow pastures and hit the patch of woods we were in. The trees would go nuts, bending nearly in half, branches falling, thunder cracking every five seconds. And all I could do was slam a couple of beers in the hopes I'd pass out quick so I wouldn't have to lay there sweating it out, crossing my fingers. A tornado wouldn't spin up or a tree wouldn't land on me in the middle of the night, completely at the mercy of Mother Nature. A couple of times we did have to evacuate the tents and go down to the cave at the bottom of the cliff. We made it through that summer, mostly, unscathed. But two years later, the entire camp, including the open-sided two-story mess hall slash field lab and most of the trees in the camp area, got completely flattened by straight-line winds. I saw the pictures and got chills thinking about what could have happened if there had been people actively working there at the time. Growing up in the Appalachian region of North Alabama, and as a Boy Scout who spent lots of time in the woods, I heard plenty of stories of cryptids, be it Bigfoot, Skinwalkers, or whatever else, if it's a supernatural being said to dwell anywhere in the southeastern United States, I probably heard about it. I never loved being alone in the woods at night. It was always slightly off-putting. Sometimes I felt like I was being watched but I did love the outdoors. When I was a Boy Scout, probably 12, 13 years old, we camped at a campsite on the shore of a lake in northeast Alabama. It was July at the time, and it was the sweltering hot that only Southerners can relate to. It was so hot that I was laying 
in only my underwear on top of my sleeping bag at 11 p.m., sweating. I couldn't sleep, so I decided to go sit by the embers of the fire we had earlier that evening. I went out, and about five of my friends are also sitting around the fire for essentially the same reason. I went and sat with them, and we talked for several minutes. There was a two, three-mile hiking loop up and down a nearby mountain that we decided to hike because we were all bored and couldn't sleep. We notified an adult and started our journey, just us guys hiking up a mountain in the middle of nowhere at 11 at night. It is important to note that there is a small ditch running parallel to the trail, presumably for water drainage. The whole way up, part way up, I thought I heard rustling very near us, so I stopped and shined my flashlight around, seeing nothing and presuming it was some animal. This happened twice more before I stopped everyone. and was like, do you hear that? Several didn't hear it, but a couple did. So theorizing that we were being followed, we stopped for like 15 seconds and shine our flashlights around to see if we could spot whatever we thought was tailing us. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up. My sixth sense was going crazy, and I felt like someone was for sure watching us. Then we heard it, clear as day. In the close vicinity of us, probably within 15 feet, a young girl cackled. I immediately spun around to see if anyone else had heard it, and the two cross-country runners were already sprinting back the way we came. Well, I'm 14, so I've got no time for logical thinking. I just know I'm not going to be the last in the race for survival, and I take off after them. Boy, when I tell you I had never run so fast in my life. We sprint about three-slash-fourth of a mile on a dirt trail down a mountain in the dark, nearly leaving behind the highish, functioning special member on the group and rendezvous at the camp. We were all super shook. I knew it was none of us. I was standing closest to the noise, and it was on the other side of the group from us. And I knew no one in the group could make that noise. It was a lot more coarse and gritty and authentic sounding than I think any of us could have made. We went and fetched an adult who, of course, did not believe us at first. But we were so shook that he ended up leading an expeditionary group back up the trail, consisting of the braver parts of the expeditionary group, including myself and several adults. We barely get on the trail before we see a silhouette on the dark. I turn on my heel to book it before the light illuminates it, and it's old Mr. Merkel, a mid fifty scout leader and auto mechanic in our group who starts laughing and clapping so hard that I thought he'd pass out. He tells us that he climbed in that ditch all the way up with us and made the noise to scare us. He absolutely fooled me, and that was the night that I lost my man card. So a group of friends and I hiked up into a wooded mountain on an overnight backpacking trip. During the hike in, it was drizzling rain and very foggy. Fast forward to around midnight, I'm awoken by my friend opening my tent in a panic, telling me we have to get out of here. Confused and still half asleep, I ask what's going on. There's lights approaching. More than one. Remember, we're in the middle of nowhere, not a campsite. There should be no one else around for literally miles. Another friend grabs an axe out of sheer confusion. Some of us start trying to pack out stuff to leave. At this point, we're thinking it's some sort of death cult coming to use us for their blood sacrifice. We're miles away from our cars, up steep embankments of mossy boulders. Not an easy hike out, especially at midnight. The lights keep getting closer and becoming more and more. Finally, someone goes, hold on, are those lights actually getting closer? The fog continues to gradually lift and we see that there are actually hundreds of lights and they're not moving at all. Some more time passes and we finally confirmed that it was just lights from a town miles away off in the distance. They were never moving, only appearing to get closer and brighter because the fog was clearing. Because we were all in a panic and half asleep, we never really stopped to confirm any of this info and we all felt like idiots. My buddy's mom was hiking alone on a mountain trail in Utah. The way she tells it, she was coming around a bend in the woods when, ahead of her up a hill, she saw a girl sliding down the hill towards the trail. Before the girl reached the bottom, she disappeared inexplicably. The girl never made any sound, 
but her facial expression made it look like she was screaming. This spooked my buddy's mom, so she left. When she got home, she told my friend the story, and they googled deaths in the area. They were going over headshots when she stopped him and pointed to a picture she swore was the girl from the trail. It linked to an article of a rock slide on the trail she was hiking two years earlier. A few years back, I was in Costa Rica volunteering for a sea turtle conservative project way out in the middle of nowhere. We were on the coast, but we were probably 40. 50 miles from the nearest village. Anyway, we collecting turtle eggs and reburying them in a protected part of the beach so poachers couldn't take them. The protected part of the beach was a few hundred yards from our camp and it had to be watched 24-7. One of the other volunteers and I were assigned the 1 a.m., 7 a.m. shift. So it's about 2.45 a.m. and I'm sitting there in the jungle watching. The protected are of the beach while reading Lord of the Rings and all of a sudden a red dot pops up on my chest. Like the kind of dot you'd see if someone was pointing a laser at you. The other volunteer was asleep in the chair next to me. I looked around, sat perfectly still, and after about 30 seconds the dot disappeared. And after about 30 seconds the dot disappeared. And I never found out where it came from. As a cop, my experience with the supernatural was very limited to a few traumatizing encounters with demons that left me with a deep fear for life. However, this particular account is told by a friend of mine who was a fellow officer in a small town in Minnesota. And this was back when he was a rookie on patrol. One night, he told me about an incident where they were dispatched to a call at a local residence. He said that upon arrival, his sergeant spotted somebody running through the backyard of the house. It wasn't until they got closer did they see a black figure dashing into a nearby grove of trees. They radioed dispatch for backup, cautiously approaching the grove with guns drawn, ready to shoot on sight as assuming it was a suspect trying to escape. As they got closer, a faint moaning sound broke the silence, which caused him and my partner to freeze in their tracks, where they heard a thud followed by a loud crack of a branch breaking. He looked back at his partner, who simply shrugged as my friend slowly pushed forth the trees. He saw an apparition that gave him goosebumps even though it wasn't cold outside. A stout humanoid creature began to emerge from behind a tree not more than 20 feet away, quickly making its way towards a clearing with a full moon, causing them to see a silhouette of it against the moonlight. He said that what he saw was this hulking black figure with chalk white skin and a bald head with no ears or nose or really much features at all, but could sense a deep malice emanating from this thing. All my friend could think about was his family as he slowly reached for his firearm until something slammed into him, knocking him over onto the ground. What grabbed hold of him wasn't human. It had a hand around his neck which seemed gnarled and leathery except its fingers were three times longer. The only way he described these demon hands gripping around his neck is that it felt like being a victim of a boa constrictor, and it would only tighten its grip to the point where you would die from lack of oxygen. He also explained that he could see a mouthful of razor teeth opening up as if ready to bite his head off, but thank God for a police siren that caused this thing to release him and vanish. And my friend explained that what happened next was even more bizarre than the attack itself. One car showed up while the nether approached from a different direction with her lights turned on shining directly into where this figure ran and vanished. After a brief investigation and questioning, they declared it a false alarm. My friend said that a couple of months after this encounter, the local sheriff passed away due to a sudden heart attack despite being a very healthy man in the prime of his life. He told me that he later found out years later that a strange police officer was picked up back then who claimed he saw a monster dressed in police uniform before committing self-harm shortly after his arrest under mysterious circumstances. Now, when he made the claim of monster, I'm assuming he meant as an individual, not an actual monster. He said this happened at a time where strange people... Camping in the Sedona backcountry in a canyon, we camped up on a bluff, flash flood dangers, and it started thunderstorming in the middle of the night. No one else in the canyon and definitely wouldn't be where we were in a thunderstorm. Heard something calling. 
out in the middle of the night for what I assume was a dog or another person. Looking back, there was no way in hell there would have been someone where the voice was coming from, and it didn't sound like English. It was also very loud, considering the rain and thunder, we heard it crystal clear. It was weird as F. And then I watched The Missing 411 on Netflix, about two months after the incident, completely forgetting about it. Well, there is a scene tapped in the 70s from some hunters in the remote wilderness, and it was the same sound. I literally started having a panic attack and crying, and had to explain to my husband why I was freaking out. My husband and I did a 17-mile backpacking trip in southern Colorado in the Uncompahgre National Forest. There are a bunch of old mines along the trail. We read in a hiking book or online somewhere that there were some people that are pretty territorial of the mines and we shouldn't hike back into them. First afternoon we set up camp in a valley and pretty soon a helicopter was hovering over us and kept coming back and circling us. We were about nine miles in at that point and were totally freaked out. The helicopter was white and had no markings at all. We convinced ourselves it was a dangerous gang and they were protecting their gold. Woke up to something very big sniffing my tent. It was right at the door and I could see a large silhouette with the moonlight in the background. I yelled out and grabbed a gun and a flashlight as I heard it running off. I quickly unzipped my tent and saw it was a black bear. Ironically, I solo camp in a Kodiak canvas tent. Needless to say, I didn't sleep the rest of the night. I sat on a folding chair in my tent with my 12-gauge and pistol in my lap. When the sun came up, I drove an over an hour to civilization and bought the brightest area light I could find that my solar generator could run all night. Four nights later, with my new light shining, I saw another bear walk approach my camp. It stood on its hind legs on the edge of where the area light shone. I quickly shined my flashlight at it. It snorted and it took off. Afghanistan's desert landscape sprawled before us, a harsh and unforgiving terrain. I was part of a group of us Marines stationed at Bagram Airfield, carrying out our deployment with unwavering dedication. But little did we know that the blood-red moon would bring forth an unimaginable nightmare. Under the eerie lunar glow... Strange occurrences began to unfold. Shadows danced menacingly and whispers echoed through the night air. Unease settled over our camp like a heavy fog, and we knew something was amiss. It wasn't long before our worst fears materialized. A cryptid born of nightmares and folklore emerged from the darkness. Its grotesque form seemed to blend with the moonlight, exuding an aura of malevolence. As it prowled the base, chaos and carnage followed in its wake. We were thrust into a battle against an enemy we could barely comprehend. A creature that thrived in the unholy light of the blood. Red Moon. Cut off from reinforcements, we fought with every ounce of strength and skill we possessed. Yet the cryptid's power seemed otherworldly, defying conventional warfare tactics. Its speed and ferocity were unmatched, tearing through our ranks with merciless precision. Each encounter was a struggle for survival, a desperate bid to protect ourselves and our comrades. As the nights wore on, we grew weary but refused to surrender. Our camaraderie and unwavering determination became our strongest weapons. We devised strategies, exploiting the creature's vulnerabilities and fought with a resilience born from the desire to protect one another and return home alive. But as the moon continued to cast its sinister glow, casualties mounted and hope began to wane. Fear threatened to consume us. Yet we pushed forward, knowing that defeat was not an option. We dug deep within ourselves, drawing strength from our training, our love for our country, and the unwavering bond forged in the crucible of combat. In a climactic final showdown, we mustered all our remaining strength and launched a relentless assault. Explosions thundered, gunfire echoed, and blood stained the desert sand. And finally, against all odds, we emerged victorious. Cryptid lay defeated, its reign of terror brought to an end. 
We stood amidst the remnants of the battlefield, a bittersweet triumph etched on our weary faces. We had faced an unimaginable adversary, an entity that defied reason and challenged our very existence. Our resolve had been tested, and we had emerged stronger. As we surveyed the aftermath, we realized the magnitude of what we had encountered. Our fight against the cryptid beneath the blood, red moon, had been a battle that extended beyond the physical realm. It was a testament to the indomitable spirit of the human soul, the unwavering resilience of those who serve, and the unbreakable bond of brotherhood that binds Marines together. We returned to our base, forever changed by the horrors we had witnessed. The memory of that blood-red moon and the cryptid that emerged beneath it would forever haunt our dreams. But as we moved forward, scarred but not broken, we carried with us the knowledge that we had stared into the face of darkness and emerged victorious. And in doing so, we became legends whispered among the ranks, a testament to the courage of those who walk the path of the Marine. My experience has been Pacific Northwest, mostly. Some Alaska, Montana, New Mexico. Lightning storms above the tree line are fun and remind me of how small and insignificant I am. A windstorm with sustained winds of 70 miles per hour in January in northern Idaho made us move camp at 2 a.m. to the middle of a meadow so trees wouldn't get us. A couple times bears in camp. First time I was six, mom shot it. The last time was in Northeaser, Oregon with my eight and six year old. It scared me worse with my kids. Didn't have to shoot it. One night in Arkansas and another in Idaho wolves hung around my fire. Met a grizzly heading the opposite direction on a trail in Montana. He kept to the trail. We didn't. The weirdest was hearing several somethings outside our tent on the shores of Duck Lake in the Wallowas in northeast Oregon one night. It was several things jabbering at the same time that made the hair stand up. At that point, I'd had probably 40 years in the woods. No idea what I heard. My buddy had no idea either. Heard a couple times the next couple days around the lake at different times, but not as close as the first night. I'm kinda embarrassed to say I eventually googled Bigfoot noises. Found one that sounded similar, and that to this day still makes my hair stand up. Still not prepared to say that's what I heard. All in all, around 60 years backpacking, white water rafting, hunting, fishing, mountains climbing, backcountry skiing. So really, most trips nothing too scary too often. Now some backcountry self-inflicted stupidity is another story. I was camping, and it was bedtime, and I was in my tent, reading with my headlamp. I noticed a faint buzzing sound. I thought my mind was playing tricks on me in the silence. Then my headlamp started to flicker once or twice and it completely died. Well, that's weird because my batteries were recently changed and the light didn't really dim or get more faint. Flicked once or twice and went completely out. Didn't think much of it, went to bed. The next evening I went to test my headlamp to replace the battery and it worked great. No issues. I again read my book in my tent on night two and noticed the lack of buzzing sound that I heard the night before. I have no idea what it was, but I have to assume the buzzing and light dying were related. It was very strange. I totally understand if no one believes this, because we are still unsure of what the F happened, but we sat down and came to a consensus on the events and all agreed we witnessed the same thing. Me and three buddies were hiking Thursday through Friday in San Bernardino National Forest. Various trails, mostly the known ones and mostly during the day. Friday, we were making our way to Clark's Summit. As we were walking, one by one, we noticed that we were veering off the trail. I asked my friend in front of me why he was going off the trail, and he asked our friend who was in front of him the same thing. Friend in front told us I can hear a woman talking, you guys don't hear that. We didn't hear anything. We tried to convince her to leave it be, because it was already kind of dark, 
and we were close to where we wanted to set up camp on the trail. The friend in front is female, and insisted that what she heard sounded like a female calling for help, and that she sounded really close, so I think she felt inclined to investigate a possible female in distress, while we were totally okay with going about our business. Okay, I get a bit spooked now because she's absolutely serious, and we absolutely could not hear whatever she was hearing. Here's where it got weird. We only ventured off the trail about 300-400 meters, yet at one point we were completely lost. We don't have any fancy gear or GPS stuff because we've never needed it, but we've been on this trail enough to know we hadn't gone far. Yet, we couldn't find the trail in any direction after waking for about 15-20 minutes. I started to feel weird, kind of dizzy slash lightheaded, and when I mentioned this, the other two said they felt weird as well. It was like something had changed the environment around us, or moved us somehow to another location. I had no idea which way to go, and now it was fully dark. My female friend said the woman's voice had said, I'm over here and please help me. She said it sounded like she was hurt crying. So here we are, somehow lost after only walking for about 20 minutes off a large trail because my friend is hearing voices. We decided to stop walking in any direction, because the last thing you want to do at night is get even more lost. We had two tents and sleeping bags in our packs, so we found a clearing and set up. We figured once the sun was out, we'd easily find our way back to the trail. Before we could even lay down to rest, I noticed a tree near us was moving as if something was climbing it. It was really dark and I wear glasses, so I really struggled to see. So I really struggled to see, so I called them over to see. I thought it was an animal at first. But it wasn't an animal. It wasn't anything. I could see the outline of what roughly looked like a human shape, but it was transparent, like completely see-through. The best way I can describe it is the way heat waves look on the pavement in the summer, you know, that wavy-slash-liquid effect. They saw it too, my male buddy said, what the F are we looking at when he finally spotted it. They all said the same thing. It was transparent but still visible due to the foliage around it being displaced and moving as it moved. We all just stood stone still whispering theories back and forth as to what we thought we were seeing. I thought maybe it was some kind of optical illusion, but they both immediately jumped to aliens, of course. The thing just sat there, perched on a large branch about 50 feet up. It's like it was watching us watch it. The other oddity is that after staring at this thing for about 10 minutes... We noticed all the normal forest sounds we heard prior had stopped completely. I mean, the only noise was us talking, and the leaves under our feet. The hairs on my neck stood up, and I had goosebumps all over when I realized this, like something was truly wrong. After about ten minutes of us standing there, whatever this thing was started to climb up the tree even more, until we could no longer see it all. We approached the base of the tree slowly, and walked around in a circle with our necks craned up, trying to see this thing. It was too dark, and the trees were too close for us to see the top. We didn't hear it jump to another tree, so we assumed it was still up there. We were all too spooked, obviously, to camp right underneath whatever this was, so we gathered our shit and started walking towards the moon. I shit you not, after about five minutes of walking, we were back on the trail. I literally dropped my bag and said what the F out loud. We all stood there confused, looking around trying to confirm what we were seeing. My buddy likes to joke and said maybe we walked through some hallucinogenic spores and had imagined all of that. I highly doubt that, but whatever happened it seemed kind of, I guess, predatory. Like it seems like something was luring us or trying to confuse us. My friend still thinks we were messing with her, about not hearing the woman she claimed to hear. Was it that thing we saw imitating a woman? How did we get lost so close to the trail? This was easily the weirdest thing I've ever experienced in the wilderness. We still don't have a good theory as to what we saw. It may not have been an alien, but whatever it was, it was humanoid and was 100% transparent. Somehow, and able to climb a really large tree with ease without making much noise. I would love to hear any theories about what this may have been. Has anyone else seen anything like this in the woods? 
Superior national forests sprawled before me, a majestic expanse of wilderness in Minnesota. Towering pines stretched as far as the eye could see, their lush green canopies forming a protective ceiling over the forest floor. Sunlight filtered through the leaves, casting dappled patterns on the ground, and the air carried the intoxicating scent of pine needles and earth. This was my domain, and as a seasoned park ranger named Marco, it was my duty to safeguard this natural haven. When I wasn't patrolling the trails or guiding visitors, I found solace in my other passion music. In my free time, I strummed my guitar and belted out old rock and roll tunes, the sound echoing through the trees as if they were my captive audience. It was a source of tranquility in an otherwise demanding job. One fateful morning, rumors began to circulate among the local community that a lumberjack company had been illegally felling trees deep within the heart of the forest. As a dedicated protector of nature, this news sent a shiver down my spine. I embarked on a mission to investigate these claims, leaving no stone unturned in my pursuit of justice. My journey led me deep into the woods, where the emerald green canopy above me grew thicker, casting long shadows upon the forest floor. And there, amidst the towering giants, I discovered the evidence of unlawful logging. The stumps of felled trees scarred the landscape, and the sense of betrayal gnawed at my heart. The forest had been violated, its beauty marred by greed. Little did I know that my discovery would mark the beginning of a series of inexplicable events. The forest seemed to come alive, its inhabitants behaving strangely. Animals that once roamed peacefully now displayed erratic and unnerving behavior, their eyes gleaming with an otherworldly intensity. I witnessed plants mutating into grotesque forms, twisted and distorted, as if reflecting the corruption that had invaded their sanctuary. Even the weather turned against me. Skies once serene and clear now darkened with thunderous clouds, unleashing tempests of wind and rain. It was as if the very elements were rebelling against the violation inflicted upon this sacred land. Driven by an unrelenting curiosity, I delved into the archives of the park's library, poring over old documents that revealed a haunting truth. The forest was not merely a victim of illegal logging, but a battleground for ancient elemental forces. The delicate balance between nature's elements had been disrupted, and chaos ensued as a result. With each page I turned, a sense of urgency grew within me. The fate of the forest, and perhaps the world, rested upon my shoulders. I had to navigate the ever-increasing danger and restore balance before nature's wrath consumed everything. Armed with newfound knowledge, I ventured deeper into the forest, confronting the enigmatic forces that held sway over this realm. The elemental powers manifested in terrifying displays, threatening to overwhelm me at every turn. But I pressed on, fueled by my love for this land and my unwavering commitment to its preservation. As I faced the wrath of these ancient entities, an idea began to form in my mind, a desperate gamble for the salvation of the forest. I sought out the elemental force that seemed to wield the most influence, standing before it with a mixture of fear and determination. With a trembling voice, I made a promise that echoed through the woods, a vow to protect the forest from the encroachment of lumberjacks and those who would exploit its resources. To my astonishment, the elemental force hesitated. It seemed to sense the sincerity in my words, the genuine love I held for this place. And in that moment, a fragile truce was formed. As I emerged from the depths of the forest, a renewed sense of purpose filled my heart. The bizarre phenomena gradually subsided, and the forest began to heal. Animals returned to their natural rhythms, and plants shed their grotesque forms, embracing their original beauty. Though the battle had been won, I knew that my duty as a park ranger and protector was far from over. I would remain vigilant, ensuring that the promise I made to the elemental force was upheld. The forest would be kept safe, its secrets guarded from those who sought to exploit its wonders. And so, as the sun cast its warm glow upon the towering pines, I strummed my guitar once more, my melodies mingling with the gentle whispers of the forest. It was a tribute to the enduring harmony 
between man and nature, a testament to the power of love and determination in the face of untamed forces. Camping with my mom, my little siblings, and my mom's boyfriend at the time. My mom went off with her boyfriend, said they'd be right back. An hour or so later, me and my little siblings are sitting around the campfire joking around, and our mom still hasn't returned yet. We see a police helicopter with its searchlight flying over us and hear cop sirens in the distance. In seeing this, I stupidly say as a joke, they're probably looking for mom. We all laugh. Another hour or so later, our mom and her boyfriend still haven't returned, and then several officers pull up into our camp spot. Me, being the only adult at the time in our group, gets pulled aside by the officers and told that our mom and her boyfriend were just arrested for grand theft auto. They do a quick search of our camp and head out. I then, being only 18 or 19, I think, suddenly have temporary custody of my little siblings while my mom was in jail. Yup. Me. Fifteen at the time. Some of my classmates and two teachers hiked ten kilometers into the Swedish wilderness. We set up camp beside a lake and on the other side of the lake was a some kind of mansion that looked abandoned. We slept under tarps and in the middle of the night a loud boom goes off and it's pitch black and I'm super scared. My mind instantly thought. Some old mansion owner has hiked through the woods to our side and brought his rifle. We're all going to die out here in the dark woods, my friend calmed me down eventually, and I managed to get some sleep. Turned out that the loud bang was one of our black sheep, classmate who made a small, explosive slash banger just to F with us. Deep in and off trail. Up and out to pee around 2 a.m., new moon. See what looked like lantern light maybe 200 feet away. No sounds. I stood still and watched. It moved very slowly, and I couldn't tell if toward me or not. Crawled back in tent to get a torch and my knife. Stepped back out, and it was gone. That was horrible feeling. Turning on the torch kind of made me more creeped out. Nothing happened, but I didn't sleep after that, and I heard every damn tiny sound. All OL. Checked around in the morning and found nothing to speak of. I know the likelihood of danger from another human is low, but the fear got the better of me that night. I still question if I handled it well should I have called out right away. I've only occasionally run into other hikers deep in, but mostly near trails. This particular time I was very remote and seemed very unlikely to be another hiker. Oh well. One. 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 I saw a Bigfoot cross a dirt road in northern Michigan on Sunday. May 23rd, 2020, 1 at 3 p.m. in broad daylight in the Manistee National Forest. It was eight feet tall, with light gray fur, and extremely thin. It was crouched down on all fours, then stood straight up and crossed the road in three huge steps into the pine woods and disappeared. I had six kids with me who witnessed also. Long arms, hands swung below knees, slightly hunched forward. No visible ears, short neck. Our hunting buddy also witnessed one walking through the woods on the opening day of gun hunting. We've heard wood knocks and banging on our cabin at night. Lots of activity in Michigan. This occurred in April 2018 when I was living in Escondido, California. One night around 3.30 a.m. I experienced sleep paralysis. I could not move. I was frozen. It started to get quiet and I lived next to a freeway. The windows are always open so it's loud. I am curious about how they always find me. The last house was a nightmare. It's been very quiet here for about one year. There is a sound that is hard to explain. My ears popped. There is a small sonic boom and crackle with it followed by, well, I guess the only way to put it, is hearing a ringing of deafening proportion. They must have been around all day. You know when they are there because they glimmer. They sparkle. Like a flash of light. I was seeing them all that morning walking around the property. You can call me crazy all you want, 
but when you have been dealing with this like I have since I was a child, you start to recognize certain glitches, so to speak. Static in the air, but it is just so draining. I can't move. It's as if you dimmed the night more, if that is even possible to imagine. I can feel myself slipping away. The feeling is like someone drugged you with a huge sleep sedative, full force sleep paralysis. They use this tactic all the time. Most can't handle it, so they give in or get stuck in the end. Between stages, I like to call it, where you are completely frozen, but still aware of your surroundings. The buzzing is starting to fade, but the feeling this time is so strong, almost angry. It's building, the rage. Fight or flight is kicking in. An overwhelming sense of awareness is hovering over me. Short sparkles followed by a huge shadow start to appear. I can finally start to see but get dizzy. My eyes are starting to focus on what it is that I was seeing. Then there it was. As I looked up out of bed, it was a tall, red, slender, toned body. Very fleshy looking. Reptilian around the head, but also had a very normal depiction of what a grey alien would look like. Humanoid body, five fingers, but they were very long followed by the last two being shorter. Eight feet tall, easy. Black eyes. The strangest thing is I wasn't scared, but more worried about the look on its face when it realized I could see it. Stood there forever, is what it felt like. Then it raised its hand and pointed it at me. I started to feel so weak and tired. It walked over to me and with every step it made I fell back slower and lower on the bed until it was directly on top of me, its hand still outward stretched at my head. I was now looking straight up at it, red face with giant black eyes staring me down. The jawline and cheeks were so defined, very humanoid, but the brow line is what got me. Everything is very emotionless with it, but the facial expression it made was very aware of me noticing it. I don't think it expected that I was going to see it. It did something to me. Whatever it does when they first appear is how it felt at that moment. This thing fought to put me down. You could see it on its face. The strange part, there was no fear of it. More like a comfortable friend. You could always count on being there for you in any situation. Just very calm. Trust me, I know it sounds ridiculous, but for the first time in a long time, my eyes are wide open. And what's with the number 33? It always has to do with 33. They always come or give signs at 33 on the clock, no matter the time of night. They usually come at 3.30 or 1.30. Three in the morning.